Okay, uh, good evening everyone and welcome to the second appointment of the year of school to NE24 edition. Today we'll have a lecture on digital governance and economics of human cooperation and Jerusalem and ideally working the same path that 800 years ago, St. Francis worked, Saint Francis worked to meet the Sultan of Egypt and pled for the liberation of Jerusalem. This means a gesture of peace and dialogue in history, and from Assisi to reach Jerusalem, it takes 8 million steps. With the economy of Francis, we thought of creating a worldwide campaign that will allow anyone who wants to donate Step for Peace. It will be possible to download an application that will count the steps donated and will track the path of peace crossed by young people all over the world. For this, you may visit the dedicated webpage that is franciscoeconomy.org slash steps for peace slash. I'll tell you more once we finish today. Second, we'll have a summer workshop that will be held in June in Florence and a summer school that also will be dedicated to homo mendicants, companionship and wandering. And this will be held in Laverna at the beginning of September. Now it's time to move to our lecture of today and Sorry for the small delay we had about technical problems, but let me introduce our honorable guests. Professor Jonah Bryson is professor of ethics and technology at the Herty School. Her research focuses on the impact of technology on human cooperation and EI and ICT governments. From 2002 to 2019, she was on the computer science faculty at the University of Bath, and she's also been affiliated with the Department of Psychology at Harvard University, the Department of Anthropology at the University of Oxford, and the School of Social Sciences at the University of Mannheim, and the Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy. During her PhD, she observed the confusion generated by anthropomorphized AI, leading to her first AI ethics publication, Just Another Artifacts, in 1998. In 2010, she co-authored the first national level AI ethics policy, the UK's principle of robotics. She holds degrees in psychology, artificial intelligence from the University of Chicago, the University of Edinburgh, and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Since July 2020, Professor Bryson has been one of the nine experts nominated by Germany to the Global Partnership for Artificial Intelligence. Nowadays, she advises companies, government, transnational agencies, and NGO globally, and particularly on AI policies. And that's why we're delighted to have her with us today with this lecture on digital governments and the economics of human cooperation. Dear Professor Bryson, the floor is yours. Thanks for being with us. Okay. Well, th thanks very much for having me. I'm going to share uh, my talk now. Um, please do, uh, I can't really see what's going on. So, so please do tell me if there's a problem or a comment that I should address. Uh, but I have uh, uh, too many slides because it's too exciting, the topic. <laughs> so I will try to get through them quickly. Um, yeah, we'll see how this goes, actually. Uh, I don't usually work off of this keyboard, sorry. Okay. Oh, I know what I'll do. Here we go. No, I'll just try this. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll talk first about cooperation then about polarization, then about governance, then about the future of work, because a lot of people care about that when they think about AI. And then actually the human value is not its uh, own section, it's actually sort of the conclusion. Okay, whoops, wrong way. Okay, so when do we cooperate is a big question. Um, so I'm gonna use this very American uh, metaphor of the, uh, the pumpkin pie, um, but of course uh, we want uh, sustainability. So I'm not gonna talk about the size of the pie. I'm gonna talk about, um, uh, the quality of the pie. So sustainability is basically how beneficial is the pie overall, right? How many people could the pie support? And then the fairness is about, is everyone got the same size slice? Or at least has everybody sliced big enough that it could be lived off of, right? Um, so it may be that actually it seems in economics that, that we like a little bit of inequality, high inequality, we get social unrest and the economy collapses, but very low, uh, uh, inequality, we also have a slowdown of the economy. But anyway, it's got to at least be enough that we can really flourish. All right, so cooperation is about improving the whole pie, and competition is about improving some slice or slices, if you collaborate a little bit, at a cost to others, right? And so how do we choose whether we cooperate or, or, or um, whether we compete? 
Okay, I'm going to be brutally functionalist about this. Of course, we can think about like various systems by which we encourage people to do different things. Um, and in fact, even if you look at other species like, like Norwegian rats, things like that, you'll see that they cooperate when they see others cooperating. So there can be a culture of cooperation. I'm not saying there can't be. But at the brutally functionalist level, that you cooperate if you can find a way to do it. You know, competing is dangerous. Why would you do that? <laughs> right? So cooperate, you, co you cooperate when you can, whenever you find something. And this is like one way, I'm not going to talk about AI for a little bit, but realize that this is one of the things we could be using AI to do. AI is, I mean, intelligence is search. It's about accelerating our ability to know things. So we, we ought to be able to find more ways to cooperate and to create public goods. All right, so cooperation is absolutely natural. Some people think like the Darwinian thing, like, oh, these big deer and only one's going to win. But think about it. First of all, they're probably not going to kill each other. That almost never happens. This is deeply ritualized, these sort of battles to figure out who's the winner. But secondly, the, what gets replicated, a deer doesn't make exactly a perfect clone of itself. That Well, first of all, they're, they're mammals. They, they have sex with other deer, and they make these sort of weird hybrid things. But basically, the thing that is replicated is the gene. And there's most of the genes these two deer have are almost the same. So that means that they sort of have shared interests, that, that each of the genes wants to have a way to propagate itself, and it sort of doesn't care which one gets to be the daddy. Okay, So this is why it took us a while to figure this out. But this is why it was possible you know, from, again, brutally functionalist perspective to get cooperation in nature. And you do. Like, there are no single gene. Uh, uh, there, there are no single gene animals, but there's also similarly, uh, of course, competition everywhere we look. So cooperation and competition are both natural and they're all over the place. Okay, well, one place we might really care about this is in uh, other uh, animals very, share a, lot, share a lot of genes with us, um, and that includes uh, chimpanzees. So chimpanzees, we know that you can get um, groups of chimpanzees that cooperate and they also um, sometimes they schism and they have another group but they're living happily side by side and yet sometimes they switch and they start uh, attacking it's called war and it's not like our war they go off it's like guerrilla war they go off and pick off the other group the bigger one wipes out the smaller one and takes over its territory and again it took a long time to figure out why this would ever happen but this particular paper so Jane Goodall was the first one who reported this behavior um, and, and there was all kinds of uh, sexist reasons people thought that she'd messed up and made this observation, but it was later confirmed. And um, this, this is an enormous paper where they got all the data together, and it looks like this happens when there's an ecological crisis, when there's no longer enough fruit to support all the chimpanzees, then the smaller troop loses. Um, pretty simple. Humans don't have just one group. So humans, like if you have a person, and this is not meant to be male or female, I'm just bad at drawing, okay? So every person, and if you're lucky, you might have your, your, own native, your own family that you're producing. You certainly have parents. I hope that you know at least one of your parents. Um, but anyway, there's always some kind of biological relationship that you could call your in-group, which is more how the, the chimps are kind of working. But we also have other things. We have neighbors, we have coworkers. We have people we, we socialize with, people, uh, for example, that we might uh, share uh, religions or professions or all kinds of things. So we have multiple possible identities and multiple possible groups that we can be a part of. And we take different strategies. So this is a extremely well-established uh, Dutch study. It was done a long time ago when before the Euro. So these are Gilder, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, the experiment is you ask, and each of you can think of what your answer would be. I say, here's three numbers. And these are like the number, you could say it's euros, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but, but you know, imagine that this is, uh, you know, a fifth of a euro or something. Um, which of these would you, so I, you get to choose one of the rows and you get something and an anonymous other person that you will never meet gets something else. And really an astonishing number of Dutch people choose the top line. It looks like they're looking for um, the maximum number for both. Okay, so this is called pro-social. Now, other people just look to maximize their own number, right? And this is, you know, politely called individualist. And it's interesting because when I give this talk in America, especially like in places like Princeton, everybody's like, why would anyone take any other line? I don't get it. But so there's very different ideas about what's normal depending on where your background. Um, 
So uh, again, I'm not looking at the chat. Please somebody come in and tell me if there's something I need to address right away. Um, like you can't hear me or something. Um, okay, but finally, there are people that are willing to take at least a little money less in order to hurt the other person that they'll never meet, okay? And then the nice, polite scientists call that strategy competitive, okay? <laughs> you can think of worse words to call it, okay? So these are people that are willing to take a loss to get to have somebody else take a greater loss. Okay. All right. So this is how these people are distributed in the, amongst Dutch society in 1997. So you notice that the most, as I mentioned, most people pro social. And as you got older, now it's very hard to tell this at the time, but as, as time has gone on, it does seem to be as you get older, it wasn't just that people born in 1920 or something were the ones who, who were very pro social. As you get older, more and more people are playing the pro social game. But even towards the end of life, some people are very competitive. All right. Okay. But notice that this is Amsterdam. And as I just mentioned, it's different in Princeton, New Jersey. Okay. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is that many, but not all people will pay a cost to punish others if they don't cooperate enough. And this is one of the, again, most famous studies in psychology. Um, there's this thing that people do, these, uh, these economists do called public goods games. And they say, okay, you're gonna be in a group with four people. Again, you don't know who these people are. So it can't be any, you know, I'll buy you a beer later. There can't be anything like that. The, the, um, so it's four anonymous players. They don't know who the other people are, but they're, they're really there. And then basically they're all given a bunch of sort of uh, poker chips sort of that, that they know how it's gonna transfer into real money at the end of the game. And they say, you need to choose. You can keep your chips or you can put them into the common pool. You get, to, you get a choice. And all the chips you put into the common pool, you are, get multiplied by three by the experimenters and then split between all four of you. Okay, so this creates something called a social dilemma. Because obviously the whole group, if you all put all your money in, then the group gets the maximum amount of money. You all get three times as much money as you would have had otherwise, right? However, for each like euro that you put in, you only gain three quarters of a euro back. And so this is technically called altruism. Why would you give a euro um, to benefit all the others? They all get three quarters of a euro too, but you've given up a quarter of a euro, right? So that is literally the definition of altruism, paying a cost to benefit others. And the homo economicus, as they say, that this idea that humans are only trying to optimize their own uh, return, the prediction of the economist was there shouldn't be altruism. Okay, I'm going to be mean about economists, even though my understanding is a lot of you are economists, sorry. <laughs> so, so the economists play this game, and what you see is you gave them sort of 20 uh, poker chips. And the reason we use poker chips is because this game is played in a lot of different cities, and they try to make it always worth about like half a day's wages so that it's, it's comparable across different parts of the world. So anyway, you give it to people, and ha they, what they do is they keep half and they give away half. Right. So it looks like they have no idea what to do. But then the economists are like, oh, it's okay because if you do if you play it over and over, you can see the lines going down and it's going to go through zero eventually. Now actually it turns out it never goes through zero. They, somebody got a lot of money and played this game like 40 times. And the end and the start stay the same and the slope changes. But anyway, that's not what I'm talking about here today. Today I'm talking about um, if you allow them to punish each other then it doesn't do that. In fact, they call it stabilizing, but it actually goes up a little bit here, right? And so what punishment is, is that I can choose to pay one to the experimenter and the experimenter takes three away from the people. And you, again, they're anonymous. So all you can say is that person who only gave two chips last time, I want you to punish them and you can make it not worth their time, right? So that's what, that's what people do. Okay, again though, guess what? This was done at ETH in Switzerland, in Zurich. All right, and it turns out that um, if you do this in more different places, you find a lot of different behaviors. So this is the original uh, replication of the original Zurich data, but these people went all over the world and you can see that, well, some things kind of look like Zurich there. So as soon as there's punishment, they start playing a very much more cooperative game. Um, some of them, it doesn't matter if there's punishment or not. It's just, it, actually you don't have the decline at the beginning and you don't have the rising at the end. Poor Istanbul is the worst of both worlds. Um, and then you see these people in the Far East, including Melbourne, that they don't immediately see that there's a way to cooperate more, but they discover it under the, under the influence of the punishment. Okay, 
So if you break all that down, you can actually see that how are they punishing? So the guy who started this, this guy, his, his name was Benedict Herman. He's the first author here. He saw that other study and he said, he was German. He was living in Switzerland, which is where the other study had gone. And he's like, I don't believe this for a minute because I've lived in Russia and I am sure Russians don't punish anyone. They just tolerate all kinds of corruption. And so he wanted to go test this and he was wrong. So the dark green, that's a great thing about science. <laughs> the dark green shows that actually every place he went, people did punish those who didn't give as much money as they did. But what varies between cities, so he was part right, was how much they punish those who, who pay more than they do, right? So this is literally, you're punishing someone who's giving you money, right? Why would you do that? And you notice this was 2008, right? Uh, this is during the, the, the Greek uh, crisis. You notice that in both Athens and Muscat, that even if you give the same amount of money as, as the other person, you still punish people, right? So what could possibly be going on here? Well, one thing we know is that the higher the GDP is and the higher the rule of law, and those are correlated, so it's hard to take those two out, um, then the less likely you are to do this antisocial punishment, punishing the people who gave even more than you did, okay? Um, so with my students, we took a look at this in a different way. First of all, we rotated 90 degrees, sorry. But now you see muskets on the, on the right here and Boston's over on the left. And we took it apart to see what strategy, what proportion of people are playing these different strategies in each city? And what you see is that every city has, um, has all of the strategies that we looked at. So what we looked at is, okay, who isn't even ever punishing? So that, like, sorry, the, these guys were looking at um, what is the total amount of punishment? But we looked at the, um, for each, the, for the proportions of the players who never punish. So this is, um, in 10 rounds, but we're only going to look at the middle rounds because the first and the last tend to be weird. Um, so that so the, there's a whole lot of people that never, ever punish. There's a whole lot of people that only punish if they give less. And then there's hardly anyone that only punishes if you give more. What you see instead is that there's a lot of people that punish just everyone. And so actually, if you think about it, there's four people in the group. What it looks like is it's kind of random whether you're the kind of person that punishes everyone and or if you're the person who gives the least amount of money. Because if you're already giving the least amount of money, then you can only punish the people who gave more than you, right? So it looks like the antisocial isn't in itself a strategy, it's rather a side effect of just punishing everyone, <laughs> okay? So what I think is going on here, and this is not published yet, so it's, it's the original data from T Herman, Tony, and Gekter, and, and it's a long story, but anyway, we were working with Herman at the time. Um, but what we, what we think is going on is that these guys here say, look, the current system is fine. I don't care what other people do, like notably Boston. Remember when I said, like, you know, why, why, why would anybody do anything else? These guys are focusing on improving the pie. They're saying we should all be contributing equally to make the group succeed. And these guys are improving their slice. And one of the things that Ben Determined thought was that in some of these places with low rule of law and low GDP, People didn't identify by default with other people in the room. They didn't think we are in one group. So maybe it, it, you know, they, they can't improve the pie because they don't believe there is one pie. All right, so my hypothesis, and this is me just uh, speculating, although I'm trying to get funding so I can pursue this. If anyone knows anyone who cares about this stuff, I am having trouble getting this from the ERC or anybody like that. But anyway, I believe what's happening here is that those pro-socials are the ones who, who practice the altruistic punishment and the individualists are the ones who practice the free writing, and the competitors are the ones who, who uh, are um, practicing indiscriminate punishment. So I would just love to run some experiments and test that, but I don't know yet. Okay, so now I've given you a baseline about how people behave around each other. Now let's talk about polarization a little bit. There's actually three different kinds of polarization. Um, the first one people worried about, you know, back in, in the United States, they just look, there's only two parties. Are they working together or not? So political polarization is what the oldest literature is about. And then more recently, as people got good at using you know, AI to study text, they started looking at um, the position. So like, like um, how extremely you know, right or left are you? Like how, how much do you think there should be redistribution? Things like that, okay? And so that, is, uh, you know, that, that was obviously of importance to political scientists. But then around the 90s, at least in the US, people started noticing this thing was called affective polarization. 
So originally it was thought that this was a consequence of the fact that the position polarization was getting really high. And then like this extreme polarization was where you totally just uh, hate the out group. You don't want to have anything to do with them. You don't just trust them at all. You know, it's just, it's, it's very, very negative thing. So originally it was seen that way. I don't think that's really what's going on. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit more. So very recently, again, this is actually French data. And this is not my work. You can see the people whose work it is there. It, it looks like, and this happens once in a while, that there's more than one axis of position. So people, when you, when you do data crunching on them, um, you still see the left, right, but it's not even as important. There's, the more important one is what the authors of this paper call local versus global, or sometimes in other parts of the paper, they call it anti-elite, right, versus global, okay? Um, and the interesting thing is that, so this is just showing you that there's these two dimensions. If you look at who it is who is retreating uh, fake news, which was the actual interest of the authors, um, it is these people who on the left-right spectrum are the furthest in the two extremes. And then on the, as I said, I would call it the, the affectively polarized spectrum is the ones who are polarized. So basically of the people, what the, the middle of the left-right spectrum is made out of sort of unpolarized people and the extremes of it are made up of polarized people, okay? So a lot of people think social media is the thing that polarizes. It is a means by which you can communicate these positions and the positions can um, be distorted, but that seems to only happen within the polarized, the affectively polarized people. And there's uh, hundreds of papers showing the lack of correlation between how much time you spend on social media and how polarized you are. So for example, one of these, it was in nature, you know, it should have had impact. Um, the second from the bottom here, they, they uh, read it itself got more polarized after Trump was, was became elected, but it was because new people who were polarized joined Reddit, okay? This other thing, the Argentinian one is just amazing. It's like the, um, they, they took, they, they looked at who people followed on Twitter and figured out if they were polarized or not based on uh, whether they only listened to people just like themselves, or if they listened to diverse voices. And then they tried to see like what, what would, um, what would make them less stressed, what would, what would lower their, their social aversion. And the four things they did was like tell people to quit Twitter, leave them alone, uh, give them a more polarized uh, uh, reading thread on Twitter or give them a less uh, polarized reading thread, so a more diverse one. And basically, none of those had impact on the people who were not already polarized. It, none of them made them, they, they weren't stressed, they did not get more polarized, and, and they had predicted that a leaving Twitter would make it better, right? No, for the people who were already polarized, the only thing that didn't make it worse was leaving them alone. Any change made them even more upset and stressed. So. So it is in social media use that makes you polarized, although it may help you communicate new positions if you are already effectively polarized. However, what we do know, and this is, goes back to position polarization, is that it is correlated with inequality. Again, this is American data going back to the beginning of American income tax. So that we can see that it's one of these nasty graphs where you have one side which is showing what, what percent of the GDP is owned by the top percent of earners, and the other side is showing you um, a score made up of how much do people in, in Congress cooperate. And so you see the last time we had as high of polarization and as high of um, inequality, both, as now, was around World War I. And, um, and so and immediately after World War I, there was a bit of disruption, and then you get, um, and then it spikes up again, and then you have the, the crash. And basically what happens was enough at that point, enough of the elite joined with the proletariat that we got the New Deal. And so you see that the, this increase in political cooperation that was able to bring down the level of inequality and then things were relatively calm. Now we all know the 1970s were not perfect, but by these two metrics and, and by sort of the, the, the hot war, there, there was, it wasn't too bad, um, but it's gotten a lot worse since 1978. All right. So, we have, now this is again unpublished, although we have a published model that predicted this, and now we have this as secret data that might hopefully get embargoed soon. But we have shown that indeed, um, the, the specific problem isn't inequality itself, but rather uh, if you allow inequality to create false scarcity. The real problem 
is not, it's not about how rich or poor you are. That doesn't change things. It's about, are you getting richer or are you getting poorer, right? So people that are at the same amount of money that they're making, but if they decline towards that, they're much more likely to be polarized. And this is panel data, which means that we looked at people over and over across time, and we were able to see that not immediately after they lost their income, lost their job, but, not, but after a couple of years, they became highly affectively polarized and they lost their generalized trust, right? Okay, so governance. Um, I'm, I have to go quickly now. I, I think I started at, at about quarter past, so I've got about five minutes, but I have less. Uh, we'll leave you more time for the surprise and don't worry. I mean, okay. you can get five. I don't want to cut off the q and I see there's some questions already. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, so there's, these are, so I was just asked recently, what did I think were the top three challenges to democracy? And the, the top three that came up with was there's this problem that, again, I showed you with social media, we can see how well different messages work. So you can use A-B testing to choose, you know, information too. If you're honest and you're just trying to communicate, you can see what works. But also people can see what kind of messages get repeated by, um, by the affectively polarized. Um, I think what is not discussed enough is the second problem here about identifying unique manipulable individuals. So Christopher Wiley uh, wrote a book, you know, he was the whistleblower that Carol Caldwalder talked about Brexit and Trump. And a lot of people don't believe the book. They think it's like he's just a storyteller or whatever. Um, I was in the UK at that time. I know what people were asking me to do. I actually think quite a lot of, of the book is accurate. Um, and one of the things he talks about is that they were so good at finding specific individuals with really weird beliefs. And so when I look around like the kind of mayhem that is sometimes being caused by individuals, and also we could think about, I don't know if you saw this, the guy who, who allowed the introduction of the XY backdoor, right? They, they manipulated, they picked one person that had, you know, he said, uh, he, they, I don't know, they said that they had mental health issues. They picked a person that was really important they bombarded them with actually fake uh, accounts claim, saying, well, we need an update, we need an update. And then they were able to get this, this person in who was the one who inserted the, the back door that this other person was supposedly helping the, the first guy, right? So, so that's, that's a more recent version. These are a couple of older versions of people that were you know, individuals that wound up uh, causing a lot of crisis whether by burning a Quran and creating an international uh, problem or leaking enormous amounts of information um, onto the gaming sites, uh, which apparently included Russian and Ukrainian uh, 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 gamers, right? So I worry about that. But the third thing that I worry about a lot is regulatory capture. So you hear, when you're talking about trying to regulate artificial intelligence, a lot of people are like, oh, you're trying to stop industry. It's like, no, governance is not antagonistic to business. I mean, it is absolutely essential for government to that their economy survives. I just cannot believe. And you know, the the big tech in the West Coast. I was working um, pro bono for some reason with Google quite a lot at that time. There were some policy people I knew, and they were saying, "Oh, you know, we're going to leave the EU as soon as the GDPR starts." It's like, yeah, right. And they didn't leave. But a few months later, they were saying, "Oh, well, you know, the GDPR. It seems it's it's like a single API to, to 28 countries." I'm like, yes. You know what the EU is? It's a trade block. You know what they do? They make it easier to trade, but they do it in a way that's not going to break the, or we try to make it so we aren't going to break our culture. So I realize this is um, a, a global kind of thing. And I, a lot of you are sick of hearing about EU law. We're not trying to regulate the world. We're trying to make sure that we're safe. And then there's knock on effects that other people can or cannot, you know, can make their own choices about whether to do business with the EU. And if you do do business, yes, it constrains you a bit, but this is not intended to regulate the world. It is intended to make the EU safe um, uh, if we have more digital business. And I think other regions should make their own rules, but they can uh, look and see what worked and what didn't work in the EU and whether they can use some of those patterns, but they don't have to use all of them or any of them. Okay, so um, market dominance in contrast to governance is necessarily antagonistic to innovation. And that is something that's been known for more than a century. And there's something called antitrust law that tries to deal with it, okay? This is one of the most recent books about this. Although, like I said, it's, you know, the theory came up in like the 1870s or something, right? Um, in every sector now, whichever company is investing most in software 
is becoming market dominant. So there's no longer, there, there used to be something called natural monopolies, but now it's like everything like Walmart or Amazon can become a natural monopoly because they've solved logistics. Is that my, that's my interpretation. It's basically um, now you can, anyone can scale. And so when that happens, one of the things that happens is the people who have become dominant First of all, with lower diversity, you get less innovation, right? Diversity is critical to being able to handle change. But secondly, also, they're winning. So why would they want things to change? So change tends to slow in this context. So um, I don't know. Again, we don't have that much time. And I, I, I just wanted to show that this was something that people were trying to stop. Well, people. The U.S. was trying to stop. Um, Europe from writing all this legislation again. Why you know it, it, it benefited American companies, but whatever. And they made up these weird graphs focusing only on the largest companies. And it's like, why would you do that? Even I, this is before I knew much about antitrust, and I'm just still saying, well, like I, even I learned in part of my PhD that you don't want too big of companies. So why would you only look at the largest ones? I want to see the whole digital economy. And so nobody could give us that for some reason. Most countries have an idea of their digital economy, but it's very hard to compare them. So what we did is we went to uh, the, one, the, the, the database of all the patents that people defend globally. So that's kind of an expensive thing to do. And we said, who had at least two patents in this particular subcategory, which is not all of AI, but it's, it's a part. It's just sort of a random subcategory. And then we looked at all those companies and we said, what is their market capitalization? So when we say size, it's like how much borrowing power does that company have? What does the market think that it can support? And so what you see on this is the um, notice this log log and that the, the x-axis is the market capitalization. It's redundant. It's also the circle size. And the y-axis is the number of patents. And so one thing you can see is these are somewhat independent, right? It's not that, that you need money to, to innovate. Um, but also you can see that you know, like Apple, we know it's innovative. It just doesn't defend its stuff with patents because they don't trust anyone, right? So they keep it all secret. Um, but anyway, you can see that small companies can also produce a lot of IP. But anyway, there's two measures. And then by these two measures, we can go and see what's going on. And actually, China and Europe look are more comparable than people expected at that time. And the interesting thing is that the rest of the world combined, excluding the US, had more patents and more market cap than either China, than China and the EEA combined, right? But then if you combine all that stuff together, the US was dominating, right? So this, bi, this bipolar story that, that people were giving us wasn't making sense. Now, of course, you can reasonably question, that was actually worked on with Melania Malakova of the European Commission, uh, Director General of Competition, incidentally. Um, but she and I did that together and it's, it's, it's kind of a chatty little paper. Uh, this, the, I'm going to show you um, new data from Duke Dorfs. This is also not published. This is not an unpublished paper. But if you looked at 2018 and 2019, you see the EU is actually past, this is just the patents, that's past uh, China. But then what happens? Um, well, one thing that happens is we published our paper. Okay, so now we might be affecting the data here. But now you see some kind of weird competition going on between Japan. And notice that Vika broke Japan out. So between Japan and China, that they both start massively increasing the number of patents. Um, and the EU does start falling behind. But look, the US is kind of falling behind in 2022. 2021 is very close to um, COVID year. We didn't do COVID year because there was a lot of weird bubbles there. But this is the market cap. Again, look, the, the EU was ahead of China in 2019. Um, and it, it fell back a little bit. It was focusing a lot on COVID. Um, and then it, it came up again, but not as much as China came up. Um, the 2021, I think you're still seeing the bubble for the for the US but, and also for some of the rest of the world that was in bubble land. But I think China here is actually putting, uh, the patents are in some of their, their companies that are getting more and more market investment. And I suspect what's happening is that the EU is, um, a lot of these patents are held by conventional companies. So the ones that are not, their market cap is not growing that much. Um, but and that's why you don't see this 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 like exponential increase of the size. But there's still the the innovation is still happening, right? So I think that's what's going on, as I just mentioned. Um, the interesting thing is that the China is doing digital governance, unlike the U.S. Um, and they have found interventions. Again, this is unpublished, and but you can find it online uh, as a draft. Um, that it, it looks like some of their interventions work. So they, they are able to, in, to ensure there is still diversity in the same markets that their big tech is in. So that's really cool. 
Anyway, the EU has a lot of stuff going on in regulations. I mentioned everybody's all excited about the AI Act, but in my opinion, the Digital Services Act, which is the way that we're protecting ourselves against that hacking I was talking about before, um, uh, you know, identifying people by their social media and, and, and giving people different ads and things like that. That's the Digital Services Act, the DSA there. And the DMA is about this market concentration problem. So that's what the EU is doing for itself. I really, you really want me to talk about future of work? Uh, are we okay to go over a little bit? Yes, please, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, I, this is literally only like three slides on this, and then there's like one slide at the end. So this is this brilliant. Uh, there's some more papers that have come out that are similar, but this was the first one. These guys were the first out the door. Noy and Zhang, they were MIT students. They got into science with it. They actually went and looked at a whole bunch of people that were um, writing advertising copy. And, and, they, and they showed that um, these writers, college-educated writers, that overall their productivity in increased by 40%, okay? Um, and how this happened was that the inequality between the writers fell because the bottom, the worst writers leveled up, but they didn't level up to the top. They leveled up towards sort of the third quartile. And they all, in aggregate, they all enjoyed their jobs better. However, the top 20% of writers, uh, although they initially adapted it, they, they eventually saw it wasn't helping them and they just abandoned it. Okay, this is an advertising. I, from what I hear, a lot of companies are trying to incorporate this, uh, this LLM and, and they aren't finding it that useful because you will always get these mistakes, right? Maybe advertising is the one place where it doesn't matter what you say. I, that's a terrible thing to think. Um, but anyway, let's talk about the future of work. So we have more AI than we've ever had, and we also have more jobs than we've ever had. Okay, well, why would that be? And part of the reason is because when you have automation, um, you actually reduce the costs of things, right? So um, when you have automation, it improves productivity, that drops the prices. And then that can actually increase demand so much that employment goes up, and that's actually quite normal. And then what, ha then what happens is the big question. So what you see here is for steel, for iron and steel, um, eventually employment gradually did come down, but not immediately when you introduced the automation, and automation keeps increasing. Um, but it was, it was more gradual than that. Um, and what you're seeing with motor vehicle production, there's about as many workers as there's ever been. So we're just being more and more effective at producing uh, vehicles, even though we have this, this uh, automation. So um, yeah, so eventually demand may satiate and jobs may gradually reduce as the productivity continues to increase, but demand might not satiate too. Okay, so another little piece I really wanna talk about is wage structuring. So when you have automation, um, some skills that people spent, you know, decades developing, or indeed that they just happen to be born with, um, they suddenly have a different value. Some will go up and some might go down. Okay. So this is a really interesting book to me, uh, Jamesville, partly because my grandparents grew up there, but it's, it's the, the, um, the, the, no, it's my mom. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The, the focus of the story is that, is that there was a big uh, Chevy plant that had very high wages that, that gets shut down. So, but if you look at the community as it had been in the 70s, like or actually through the most of the 20th century, everyone there knew what the wages were available per hour by the cent. And this increase of these very high paying jobs in automotive, which of course during World War II was immediately turned within like a, you know, a month into munitions, okay? So that was part of what's going on with this. So this, this plant, um, I think that's part of the means by which during the New Deal, we, we got the dis redistribution up, okay? So up until the, the uh, 90s, they, for decades, they had this thing where they all knew what were the best jobs, they were all competing to get into them, and they tried to get into the plant, and even if they didn't get into that plant, there was this hierarchy of what were the next best jobs, right? And so everyone was assorting themselves in high school trying to get to this point. Um, and then they, uh, they knew each other and their relative wages for life. They all knew what was going on. They're all trying to work their way up or down. They had their various sized houses. And then America decided we didn't need unionized labor anymore. The, the, the factory is shut down and the entire thing collapses. And they, you know, the, the, again, there's sort of charities for a while, but then nobody had the money for the charities, right? So, so this, this is the kind of situation. So the, the best predictor 
um, by county at the relatively low granularity level of who voted for Trump and who voted for Brexit and who vote who which are the regions that um, were susceptible to Russia out of Ukraine. This is where there's been this kind of economic collapse, and then everybody in that town, even if they're the really rich people, they still have less than they expected, and they might be having trouble with mortgages and things. So I showed you that result earlier. So yeah, as I mentioned this already, uh, right? So if you uh, if you have these situations, I think you have to have intervention, right? So otherwise, you will get this populism and and a revolution and everything else. Yeah. Um, you, there ought to be people, and this is what you see like in Nordic countries, of uh, as soon as a factory shuts down, the, the government wades in, chooses a new industry for that town, inserts it, you know, and retrains the population. You can only do that if you're wealthy, though. So there has to be some kind of adequate redistribution to be able to do that governing, right? Um, another side of the problem, so that's about the old projects that were good. Another part side of it, though, is that new newly... Um, there may be new demand, and sometimes that takes a while for the economy to recognize. So we want to make sure that, first of all, that people can handle this, that these changes, we have to realize it will be local tragedies, you know, people are, are smaller, at least smaller houses for some people, right? But it can also be locally beneficial. And I just love this little book about the fact that the Industrial Revolution, everyone thinks, well, that was so awful, you know, it was so much effort, although, you know, People moved to the cities from the farms, so the farms were even worse, right? <laughs> but the um, but it actually, so they think, well, people with disabilities are at a disadvantage. It must be terrible for them. No, a lot of people with disabilities couldn't work on farms, but could work in a factory. So it actually was good, right? It's amazing. All right, anyway, so uh, AI uh, security and wages. AI can be used to either commodify people or to enhance human abilities. Commodify means making them more ex exchangeable. We all have the same skills. We can all run the LLM ourselves. or And that we, we would expect a lower wages. But if we instead try to enhance human abilities, increase our productivity, then if we're adequately uh, uh, correctly governed, then we should also increase our wages, which is actually what we're seeing in Germany, at least with most companies. The vast majority of people whose jobs are automated uh, with AI wind up with better jobs in the same company. Um, so. So this is, I don't think I have time to explain this. The idea is that if you could increase productivity, you would expect both taxes and wages to go up. Um, and with that, with taxes and productivity, we'd expect security to also go up. Um, and then the taxes could potentially pay into the welfare system. Now, if you do that, then in theory, that reduces productivity because some people uh, choose not to uh, work then because there's a good welfare system. But it may also be that a welfare system supports wages. This is what we're seeing in the U.S. right now post-COVID, that people are saying, you know what, it wasn't that bad to be unemployed. Forget it. And so now wages have had to go up, which is great because it increases redistribution. So it may be that this actually helps, again, actually improve productivity because we can reevaluate and see who, which people are, are, are producing this, the most value. And anyway, I think we need to think about the welfare system and wages as both supporting domestic stability and domestic glue. And that is also important to security, right? If, you're, if your people don't believe in your country, you aren't gonna be secure either. Um, so anyway, this is just me brainstorming. It's not even a paper. And this is my concluding slide, I, prom I promised. I don't know if you guys recognize Metropolis lady, uh, only half in costume there. But um, human justice is built on our accountability. So a lot of people sometimes think that the AI itself might be responsible or something. It makes no sense to, to just conceptualize the things that way. Um, because um, we can't, we can't, we just can't coherently ask AI to care about going to jail, right? If you build that part in, you can take that part back out again. Remember the hackers and everything. So it doesn't make sense to think that we could just replace all our physical and our intellectual labor. I think it makes much more sense to think of humanity as the motive so source, it's the core. Jobs are relationships between people. And then the question is, once you've made an achievement with those other people, <clears throat> how do you redistribute the, the consequences? How much do different people make for having, for having participated, right? And if economics can't explain that, then maybe it's not the right, it's not the right field. Maybe some other fields are gonna wind up becoming more important in the coming decades. Um, so I think that in a just society, the ones that we should be trying to achieve, AI should be seen as an extension that enhances all workers and that we recognize our importance as the moral core. Okay, thank you.
Thanks a lot, Professor Bryson. Thanks a lot for many insights you provided. Actually, I'm feeling also, you know, the relation dynamics between AI, fear of people, and what's going on sometimes. I now leave the floor to Juan Carlos Mondragon, uh, which will be your discussion. Juan Carlos, you have seven minutes. I'm sorry because we have a bit of time. <laughs> So I'll be strict on time. Please use your time carefully, and then we we'll leave the floor to Professor Bryson for a reply. All right. Thank, thank, you thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much, Plinio, and the organizers for this honor. Professor Bryson, it's a great honor for me to comment on your work, which I, I feel very anxious about that, about <laughs> my, of course. Great. Uh, first of all, it's a great honor to and a privilege to comment on your work, especially in this enlightening talk and considering your extensive expertise in psychology, behavioral and applied economics and cognitive science. Uh, I, I recognize my uh, relative inexperience in behavioral and applied economics. However, my background is more on political science and uh, political economy. And I would like to offer some insights into the development of a potential theory of governance uh, of the digital world and the economics of cooperation. Uh, so my objective today is to reflect upon this development of a theory of digital governance and economics of uh, cooperation. And for this, I'm, I'm using Richard Sudberg, uh, Sudberg's work, The Art of Social Theory, in which he says, today we are more uh, social scientists are very good uh, in methodological aspects, but they are not that good in creating theories or creative theories that help us to explain the world. So I'm basing these ideas in, in that we are maybe theorizing on, on the theory of digital governance and hopefully these insights could help to integrate your work in a, into, a, into a theory of, of, of this um, digital governance. So, to begin with, I would like to bring some of the principles that in the uh, economy of Francesco community we hold. One of the first, uh, I, I think, strengths of, of the community is our uh, emphasis on the difference between the common good and the total good. So we believe that the total good refers to the sum of the individual goods, which may allow for the marginalization of some for the benefit of others. In contrast, we believe that the common good is a collective benefit where each person's value is essential and interdependent. As stressed by Samani and Bruni, the common good framework necessitates that every individual is considered a vital part of the whole, forbidding the sacrifice of any one person for the sake of others. This perspective is crucial when considering AI's potential to exacerbate socioeconomic disparities and its benefits might not be distributed equitably, thereby, thereby disrupting societal balance and equity. We also believe in, in, a, in, in the state market, that the state market binary should be embraced in a different way, in a trinomial approach. So we believe it, that is not only state and market, but also the potential and the strength of the society in helping in governing these commons. And as you can, uh, I'm, I'm sure you agree that, that the AI is, is becoming the new uh, commons of the world. So balancing what you have taught, uh, uh, what you have shared with us uh, today and with these ideas, some questions would be, how can AI be governed to ensure individual actors are responsible while also contributing to the collective welfare, respecting both individual contributions and the integral, integral value of every person. How can AI governance and cooperative economics be a structure to mitigate the negative impacts of cultural and socioeconomic disparities, ensuring inclusive and equitable outcomes? Is it possible to consider policies and frameworks that prevent AI from becoming a tool that exacerbates inequalities instead of a technology landscape that supports the universal destination of goods and equitable access? Can we create strategies for leveraging AI in ways that support solidarity, job creation, and a human-centric economic development in line with both technological advancement and societal needs. 
we also, uh, is it possible to integrate the idea of moving beyond the state and the market in which society has a strong role in governing uh, the AI world? And is it possible to ensure that AI systems are transparent, understandable, and above all, that they respect the dignity and rights of all individuals, particularly in complex decision-making processes? So some, some reflections for this, we must consider reconciling digital governance with diverse economic systems. And this, this mainly comes from your work and, and the varying states of rule of law by focusing on local cooperative variations and institutional capabilities. Uh, this leads also to questions about AI's potential roles in economic systems. Uh, also, the potential in addressing economic challenges like instability and inequality. AI could be employed to identify and alleviate issues such as inequality and instability, economic instability, potentially through predictive analytics, for example. However, its application needs careful oversight to, present, uh, to prevent exacerbating existing disparities. Uh, moreover, AI's role in societal polarization, it's, it's complex as well. It can be used for polarizing purposes, but also it can be used to de-escalate in polarization, as you, as you suggest, perhaps through more promoting diverse viewpoints or facilitating cross-divide dialogues. Um, finally, integrating AI into economic systems and societal governance must be approached with caution aiming to maximize its benefits while minimizing potential harms. Uh, combining these insights, I believe, from your work and the E of community and other so uh, Catholic social teachings, maybe that we can envision a holistic framework for AI governance. This framework should, should encompass state regulation, market innovation, as you have kindly uh, said, and societal ethics, ensuring AI development aligns with the broader humanistic and ethical goals. Uh, so basically, those are the questions and the reflections I would like to share. Uh, is it possible to create a theory? Is it possible to regulate and to provide a, a good framework for governance in the AI digital world? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Juan Carlos, for being on time, perfectly on time, I would say. For the surprise, and the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you. I think I'll try to get it done in about three. Uh, thank you for your comments. I think they're really useful. Um, and uh, and I, I think we are very much aligned. Um, although I will have one thing that I will sort of turn on its head a little bit. I do, I do hope that you saw that I was also producing theory as well as playing with data. And I and I do think that this is really something, especially when we talk about these kinds of global. Uh, perspectives that you have, we have to recognize we do have natural experiments. Um, we do have uh, countries, and, we, and in some countries, we have states within countries where the digital, the experience of the digital transition has has, in, has increased and decreased in equality. So we can look and see what has been working. Um, the thing I'm going to turn on its head is that I don't think this is about governing AI. I really, really think this is about governing. And AI is like the new paper. It's like, you know, we write down our intentions on it. Um, and, I, and I'm really, I, it's not only in terms of economics, but also in terms of security recently looking at what, for example, this, this situation we just found out about over the weekend about um, Israel using uh, AI to rapidly classify who is a target and who is not a target in Gaza. Okay, so the question here is, um, uh, well, there's a lot of questions, of course, we don't know. It could be that, that they're doing that just as the kind of ethics washing, so they can come up with a narrative about anyone. You can connect anyone to anything, and, you, and, you, and then you don't, you're not actually doing anything. But it's possible if we take it, in, you know, that, that maybe it's a great tool, and it really is identifying the best candidates. Uh, to, but then you still have this question, so what do, how does it change that, that the Israelis suddenly know these candidates much faster? And I think this is the real problem for our security and for our, our uh, how we're able to help each other is we are just handing a lot of people a huge amount of power. Um, one of the things I very much worry about is, uh, so oh, I will take, I, I will contest your issue about there being three things, you know, the, the government and the, um, the government, the business and the society. Um, I think 
what we really need is uh, for government more and more to be clearly an expression of the society. So the, so the government is the means by which we were trying to ensure, as I mentioned, it was, it's the means by which we were trying to ensure that our corporations are not doing the wrong things, that they're doing the right things, and, that, that, and to help us uh, provide for our common security, that provide for the common defense, as we say in the US. Um, so, so, those, so we constitute our states, and then states use governments to coordinate. So I'm not sure we really, I mean, it may be that, for example, journalism, uh, maybe we really do need these. It's easier sometimes to modularize. So maybe we do need to have other other uh, sectors. Um, but I, I sometimes feel like people are abandoning government a little too easily as if it was this alien force. It's not an alien force. And similarly with AI, there's a lot of people that believe AI makes things opaque. Look, it's a product. You get to decide whether, you know, like it's poisonous, right? You know, like, do you get to, you know, like you know, uh, Coke used to be, uh, cocaine used to be a product and, and you know, uh, LSD used to be a product. And, and a lot of countries decided to ban those those products and they've cost, you know, I'm not trying to simplify things, but I'm just saying that, that the or oversimplify things, that um, we absolutely should not allow artificial intelligence to be in our products unless it is at least uh, maintaining and preferably increasing transparency. In a digital world, it should be easier to hold people to account to see who did what, why they chose, what their justifications are. When we build software, we call this revision control. You know, you don't necessarily write down what you did about every character, but at reasonable chunks, you're supposed to say, why did you change the code? And you can go back and see in a, a well cybersecured system, you can go back and see who changed what and why did that. And you know, they were able to go back and trace down who had hacked the back door into the system because everybody does keep those kinds of records. There's no reason for anything without AI that we couldn't have those records, except the danger of that data. Again, if another government comes in that wants to get rid of all the creative people or something. And so that is one of the things I'm very worried about is that I don't feel like, I mean, just like if you have a, a invading government coming in, you wanna be able to blow up the bridges, which normally you, that you built the bridges because that was better for, for commerce, right? Um, similarly, if, if you have, if your country's being taken over by, by someone who's gonna wipe out everybody that, that might challenge them, then you probably want to destroy the data set that was helping you to govern and be fair and just and everything else before. And so I think these are some of the problems I haven't heard enough people talking about, about how to, how to, you know, to, to, to blow up those bridges. Um, but having said that, I don't want to only take the limit bad case. The point is that we, we have more tools now, or we should have more tools to hold our governments to account, our companies to account. Um, and one of the really weird things about companies is that in the end of the day, although we should have all this information, by and large, most of the court cases involve somebody getting a hold of the email. So we know what they were intentionally doing, you know. Um, but that makes sense. The, the 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 leaders are responsible. So anyway, I thank you. I agree with your goals, um, and I hope that my comments only help you achieve those goals. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thanks a lot. Unfortunately, we have no time for taking uh, questions. Uh, Professor Bryson, if you don't mind, uh, since I've seen that your latest work is actually regarding polarization and the rising inequality economic decline. And one of the questions we got was to elaborate more on these uh, aspects. If you don't mind, I will share the link of your article with our attendees. Sure. And, uh, and uh, that, that you also share the blog post because that links to the one, not the, the articles, the secret stuff I showed you, but, but, the, but the basic idea is that when you're falling behind, uh, well, trust is a luxury good. And when you cannot afford to, you know, you have bankruptcy or foreclosure, when you cannot afford to take a risk, that's when people seem to become polarized and only trust the ones that are, that are also paying a big cost to be predictable. So that's the basic idea about it. But yeah. Thanks a lot. In a way, you replied also to that question. <laughs> so thanks for being with us. It's really been an honor and your uh, presentation has been super interesting. And I think it was clear by the tons of questions that Juan Carlos posted. Uh, Thank you. Chase me on social media. Please don't email me though. <laughs> I get to right. <laughs> but, Thanks but... for your ability and uh, we will do that. Don't worry. Uh, for the last few minutes, uh, if you don't mind, uh, my role is just to remind our attendees where are the next appointments. 
of the uh, school. Uh, so next time we'll be meeting each other will be on May 6th for uh, a, a lesson, a webinar on attention, scarcity, and love by Rose Sleggers from Tilburg University. Moreover, EOF activities do not stop here. Once again, I'd like to remind you the initiative Steps for Peace. You will find more information regarding this activity on the website of francescoeconomy.org slash steps for peace. And then we have two more activities. There are summer workshop and summer school 2024 that will be held in June and September, respectively. And still, you will find information on the uh, EOF website. So thanks a lot for everyone for being with us for today. We are perfectly on time, we'll say, for our uh, one-hour webinar, and it's been a pleasure. Enjoy to everyone, and see you soon. Bye.